Now that it's April 1st and spring has officially arrived, I thought it was time I rebirthed my channel. So from now on, Roughest Drafts will no longer be a channel about literature, movies, or storytelling. No, Roughest Drafts, as the name implies, is all about science and mathematics now. Welcome to the STEM era of my channel. And what better way to ignite things in this new era than with a video about a dead meme? I've said it before and I'll say it again, I'm nothing on this channel if not current. This meme shows the Chicago bean having melted, as reported by CBS News Chicago. For those not in the loop, the Chicago bean, or just simply the bean, is the name affectionately given to an art installation known officially as Cloudgate, made by British artist Anish Kapoor. And don't worry, we will get to him later. Rumors suggest that Kapoor hated the colloquial name the masses gave to his sculpture, but I can't find anything more than hearsay confirming this. Wikipedia claims that Kapoor initially disliked the name, but the source only suggests that Kapoor liked it. But anyway, an article from New York Magazine chronicled the Bean's rise to meme status. One Chicago resident told the outlet that even before the internet took hold of the Bean, it had been an inside joke among the city's residents for ages. Some Chicago natives absolutely hate it, others love it, and others still love to hate it, clowning on it affectionately. In late 2017 and early 2018, Chicagoans used Facebook to create events centered entirely around the Bean. These events include Windex the Bean, Paint the Bean Black so they can't Windex it, Pour Paint Thinner on the Bean after they paint it black so we can Windex, Add Googly Eyes to the Bean and only refer to it as Steve, and so on and so forth. These memes made the Bean a staple in internet culture. Now, almost anyone who is active on the internet around this time knows of the Bean's name, existence, and meme status. This would ultimately snowball into this CBS News meme from Pat Wallen. But let's say we wanted to turn the bean into the T-1000. Let's say we wanted to take all the Chicagoans who hated this piece of modern art and plan a little event for all of us to get together. But, you know, not on Facebook because that's a sinking ship. Sorry, back to the matter at hand. If we were to band together, what would it take for all of us to melt the bean? Before we get into it, let me just say that for ease of calculation, I have rounded a lot of the numbers up or down to a simple significant figure. Some of you might call me a hack for this, and I will take that in stride. Keep in mind, this is my first video about STEM, after all. So, at what temperature could we melt the bean? Stainless steel has a melting point of about 1500 degrees Celsius. Notably, this is far greater than the 304.5 degrees in the corner of the meme, which we assume is Fahrenheit given the American setting, but regardless, that's the easy answer, 1500 degrees Celsius. A more interesting answer might follow. The bean is made of stainless steel and weighs 110 tons, or about 10,000 kilograms. Stainless steel has a heat capacity of around 0.5 joules per gram degree Celsius, which means that if you want to raise one gram of the substance one degree Celsius, you need to add 0.5 joules of energy. So let's do some quick maths. We multiply 10,000 kilograms by 1,000 grams per kilogram by 0.5 joules per gram degree Celsius. This comes out to be 5 million joules per degree Celsius. In essence, this tells us roughly how much energy we have to put into the bean to raise it 1 degree Celsius. 5 million joules. That's a lot of energy. To make our calculations easier, let's say we're melting the bean on an average December day with the temperature being about 0 degrees Celsius in Chicago, according to Google. That means we want a difference of 1500 degrees Celsius. So, to know how many joules per gram degree Celsius we need to get the bean to its melting state, we just multiply our previous number by 1500. Ergo, 5 million joules per degree Celsius times 1500 degrees Celsius equals 7.5 times 10 to the 9th power joules, or, in simpler terms, 7.5 billion joules. To contextualize how much energy that truly is, it takes about 50,000 joules to heat a cup of coffee, so the energy we'd need to melt the bean is the same as the energy required to heat 150,000 cups of coffee. And keep in mind, this is assuming the bean won't radiate heat to the outside and that whatever method we use to heat the bean uses perfect conduction. Obviously neither of these two stipulations is likely, but we've made it this far. If our goal is to melt the bean and we want to get as many people involved as possible, well, there's a simple method we can devise with an object that most everyone owns, a toaster. Toasters are usually rated at 1200 watts. That means they use 1200 joules of energy per second. Once again, I reiterate, we're supposing that the bean does not radiate any given heat from its surface and that the heat is transmitted perfectly from the toasters to its surface. If we could rally a hundred angry people with toasters, we could transmit 120,000 watts, or joules per second, to the bean. 
By taking 7.5 billion and dividing it by 120,000, we find that it would take 62,500 seconds to melt the art installation at this rate. That's about 17 and a half hours. We assume this rate scales linearly depending on the number of toasters. So if we could get 250 people to each bring their own toaster, that would give us 300,000 joules per second, which whittles the time down to just under seven hours. Now, there's definitely more to be had here, more that I'm certainly not capable of explaining here in the first STEM video on my channel, but to all my fellow physics and math people out there, I invite you to consider what might happen in this scenario if the bean were radiating heat from its surface, or how many toasters it might take if the transmission of energy weren't perfect, which it likely wouldn't be. But, to come to some sort of conclusion, 250 people armed with toasters and a disregard for all but freshman level physics laws could take care of that sucker in a single workday. So, I suppose the question then becomes, why would we want to melt the bean? Well, for one thing, the artist, Anish Kapoor, is a real piece of work. On May 18th, 2017, a petition went up on change.org with the title, Stop Anish Kapoor Stealing Our Light and Color. As the petition itself explained, the stated goal was to stop Anish Kapoor, who owns a large studio at the back of the houses on Camberwell New Road, building an extra floor on the studio and blocking our precious light and view, a valuable thing in a crowded city. You'd think Anish Kapoor would understand the value of light, color, and social responsibility. Across London, residents are being road roughshod by councils who value commerce over community. This is one example. Residents on Camberwell New Road felt they were being entirely undermined and left out of a decision that would affect them personally. Urban design advisor Julie Greer called the building plans extremely disappointing. She said, The proposed height of the extension at 3,670 millimeters is far greater than what is necessary to extend a building at roof level. Its dominance due to its height, scale, and use of materials remains unacceptable. The design does not integrate well with the host of buildings and the proposed use of materials is inappropriate. Still, despite these efforts, Kapoor remained unreachable and he went ahead with his plans anyway, in a move that was called mean-spirited by locals. Suzanne Malion, who started the Change.org petition, also reported, The planning officer in charge of Kapoor's case was really unhelpful, never visited any of the affected rooms, and actually lied in the committee meeting when he said Kapoor's team had consulted with us. Kapoor sets himself up as an engaged political individual who you would think could empathize with the residents' dismay of having to live with the oppressive height of the design, which will really impact their lives. But of course, that doesn't suit him, where commenting on Brexit or Donald Trump is better to show what a good liberal guy he is. Also, this is unrelated, but the website that interviewed Malion, Dezine, called her Malon, which just gets on my nerves as someone who's aware of how little proofreading is done in online journalism. And that's just one of many errors in the two articles chronicling this battle between residents and Kapoor. But back to the matter at hand. There is some debate as to how much Kapoor's building extension actually did affect residents. Even still, the situation highlights how, even on a local level, institutions are more interested in the rich than they are in the everyday man. As Malion said, he's part of the moneyed, connected establishment, and we feel like we're not listened to as we're less able to afford lawyers. So we just feel shafted, really. I think the thing that we found the most disappointing was the fact that Kapoor or the architects would never meet with the residents, even though we contacted Kapoor's studio numerous times. So you might think that this Anish Kapoor guy sounds a little out of touch, maybe even a little elitist. Well, wait till you get a load of this. As Truman Chambers from The Collector reports, in 2014, Saray Nanosystems released a material called Vanta Black. At the time, Vanta Black was famously promoted as the world's blackest black, absorbing 99.965% of visible light. That same year, Kapoor began to use this newly developed material in his artwork. As the article further explains, Vanta Black was never intended for commercial use in art. Still, the idea of a blackest black was intriguing for artists. However, despite the intrigue across the art world, only Kapoor was using it. Why? because he bought the exclusive rights. Now, if you think buying the exclusive rights to a particular shade of color is antithetical to art, you'd be absolutely right. Fellow British artist Christian Furr would agree with you. He was also interested in using Vanta Black, and once Kapoor bought the rights, he said in an interview, I've never heard of an artist monopolizing a material. All the best artists have had a thing for pure black. This black is like dynamite in the art world. We should be able to use it. It isn't right that it belongs to one man. Kapoor has defended the exclusivity of Vanta Black by reminding others that it was never intended to be used in art. 
He explained that there were strict safety protocols required in using the shade of black. Still, just because something is hard to get your hands on or requires a lot of regulation doesn't mean it should belong to just one person. What an awful defense. Also, I just have to highlight this quote from Kapoor's interview with Euronews. So if there's some idiot person who's out there trying to making a fuss about it, well, it isn't as he says it is. Whatever, I couldn't care less. Hmm, yes, what a normal, level-headed, and well-articulated response. This does indeed sound like the answer of someone who couldn't care less when asked about ownership, property rights, innovation, and inclusivity. Matters weren't helped when Kapoor's first project involving Vanta Black was a series of 10 watches, each priced at $95,000, with an internal layer of the experimental color. Another artist was just as unapproving as Kapoor's exclusivity as Christian Fur. This was an artist named Stuart Semple. In 2016, Semple fired back at Kapoor by introducing a pigment he called Pinkest Pink. He made this pigment available to everyone except Kapoor. When buying Pinkest Pink, a shopper would be greeted by this message. By adding this product to your cart, you confirm that you are not Anish Kapoor, you are in no way affiliated to Anish Kapoor, you are not purchasing this item on behalf of Anish Kapoor, or an associate of Anish Kapoor. To the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, this paint will not make its way into the hands of Anish Kapoor. So, if you were Anish Kapoor, what would you do in this situation? Probably ignore this, right? Let it all blow over? Can you imagine what the actual Anish Kapoor did? With apparently zero awareness of his public image, Kapoor posted a picture to Instagram displaying his middle finger, which had been dipped in the pinkest pink pigment. A real class act, this guy. From there, Semple continued a mostly one-sided feud with Kapoor. The artist would go on to create a Facebook event encouraging invitees to wear their pinkest lipstick and gather in Chicago to kiss the bean. Everyone was invited to this event except, of course, Anish Kapoor. Semple would go on to create a pigment called Lit, the world's glowiest glow, which was made available to everyone, including and especially Anish Kapoor. In fact, if Kapoor or his associates did choose to order, the pigment was free, so that Kapoor would know how lovely it feels to hashtag share the light. And despite the ways Kapoor profited off of Vanta Black, his ownership would go on to be irrelevant as an even darker pigment came to be in 2019. MIT developed a black that absorbs 99.995% of light. Artist Daimut Streeb unveiled the pigment alongside MIT engineers with a piece called The Redemption of Vanity. Accompanying the piece was this statement from the artist and engineers. The project can also be interpreted as a statement against British artist Anish Kapoor's purchase of exclusive rights to a formula of carbon nanotubes as a material for artworks. Streeb and Wardle use a different composition of carbon nanotubes, which will be available for any artist to use. So, what have we learned here today? In conclusion, I forgore. But hey, that's just a theory. A bean theory. Thanks for watching. As always, I want to give a huge shout out to my patrons and their continued support. If you want to support the content I make, you can head over there for benefits like access to the community discord, early access to videos, and priority for work reviewed on the second channel. Subscribe over there if you want some writing tips and submit your work at the link in the description. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter if you want. And in any case, let me ask, what did you think of this video essay? Do you think we could or should melt the bean? What other factors would you consider in trying to do so? Please tell me everything, and ultimately, keep in mind, this is a rough draft. <laughs>